started. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name is Mark Longo, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Ian Cousin is a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton, and has been listed uh, his other affiliations, but they're all up here. Um, Princeton Environmental Institute, the program in Applied and Computational Mathematics, Quantitative and Computational Biology, and the Princeton Institute for Computational Science and Engineering. Oh, good, I got added extra information. <laughs> Uh, so his research focuses on trying to understand general principles of collective behavior in animal and other groups uh, using a combination of experimental and theoretical approaches, most notably agent-based simulations in which group-level dynamics emerge from the interactions of individuals. These types of simulations, of course, are uh, form one of the core methodologies of complexity science. So uh, it's interesting because we're closing a bit of a loop today uh, one of Ian's early inspirations for the type of modeling that he subsequently focused on was a program written in the 80s by a, a video game developer. Uh, the program was called Boyd's, and the developer was Craig Reynolds. Boyd's represented one of the first demonstrations that uh, complex group level patterns and dynamics can arise from the interactions of agents, each only using local information and following very simple rules. This is opposed to group-level behavior uh, having to be programmed in or designed. Intelligently designed, actually, for that matter. Um, in the case of the Boyd simulation, something like flocking behavior uh, arose among virtual agents follow, who followed uh, three simple rules that had to do with uh, attraction to, repulsion from, and alignment with uh, neighboring agents. So Ian took a peek at that code he subsequently extended the approach dramatically and has been using a perspective related to the fundamental lesson in, of Boyd's to try to break down complicated collective dynamics of groups found in nature uh, into their simple interaction primitives. And we're closing the loop today because uh, I believe that Craig Reynolds, who's the developer of Boyd's, is actually here. Hi, Craig. <laughs> Uh, so, Ian is going to talk with us today about some of the principles of collective behavior that he has discovered. And uh, with that, let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Now, uh, let's see what we can do about the lighting. Does anyone know what the lighting situation is here? I guess that's lighting. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. There we go. That's a good presentation. How does that look? Great. Um, Very nice. Okay, good. I can always, I mean, I guess for some of the, the videos, it might even be beneficial. Okay, so I'm just going to show you some footage of uh, an animal group here. So here we're seeing silver sized fish schooling on a coral reef. And shortly you're going to see the European starling flocking. And we only have a very rudimentary understanding at the moment of both how and why animal groups such as this coordinate their behavior in this way. And one of the biological conundrums here is that these organisms are unrelated to each other. So they're not doing this for the benefit of the group. And collective behavior is all around us, but also within us. If you cut yourself, your cells will get into collective action to migrate the heal up wound before infection sets in. Perhaps one of the best uh, known examples and one of the best studied examples of collective behavior exists in social insects. So here we see a real ant colony, this is not a simulation, but a time-lapse footage of a real ant colony as it's laying its trails exploring the environment. Um, and there's, uh, well, Deborah Gordon here at Stanford is one of the leaders in trying to understand how social insects coordinate their behavior. But in many cases, here what we're dealing with is a highly related group of organisms. And so they're really performing behavior that's beneficial to the entire collective. Yet elsewhere in nature, including among ourselves, we are selfish individuals. Um, and this sort of highlights, this is the most complex organism we study. These are people in a train station in London. And we've been putting actors in crowds to subtly, unbeknown to the pedestrians, manipulate their behavior. This also highlights another facet of our work, is we aim to be highly quantitative. So we develop computer vision techniques that allow us to track not just the motion of these pedestrians, but also where they are looking. So I'm going to start off this journey into collective behavior 
uh, with a very pertinent and timely and also a very dramatic example of animal collectors. Those of you who've been following the news lately may have seen that Madagascar at present has been hit by a major plague. Um, and this is really potentially disastrous. And um, the FAO estimates that they need around $22 million to start implementing control measures. Because the problem with these plagues is once they start, they tend to lay their eggs and then you get multiple generations that come out. And in this particular case, this is estimated to impact around 50 to 60% of the corn and the rice uh, growing regions in this country. So you know, this, is a, a, um, this is a real issue right now. You may also have seen uh, in the news lately that locusts swarmed into Israel um, just, uh, just in time for Passover. Um, and uh, it turns out the locusts are kosher, so it's quite okay to eat them. And so you can see here um, some tips from Haaretz about uh, how to cook your locusts. Okay, but, you know, so when you see footage like this, this is the desert locust that I've been studying, um, you know, you, it's, it's really dramatic. But this is like a wildfire that's gone out of control. It's extremely costly and extremely difficult to control these flying swarms. Um, and why is this important? Well, I do my field research in Mauritania on the west coast of Africa. But this one species, the desert locust, over those multiple generations, over multiple years, can actually invade a region of the planet around one-fifth of the Earth's land surface. So an enormous problem. Um, the FAO estimates that the impact the livelihood of one in 10 people on the planet, which is really an astonishing impact. And if you take that, you know, if you think about that, you think, well, there must be lots of labs studying this. People must be trying to understand this and doing something about it. But there aren't. It's really just us trying to understand this problem. And we were sort of kicked into action uh, in a review in Science magazine that wrote, even after 50 years, fighting with this is more of an art than a science. And this is really embarrassing, because in Europe, the locust is one of the best studied organisms in the world, with a few exceptions like Drosophila, one of the best studied organisms for neurophysiology and individual level behavior. But the last time someone put them together to see how they swarmed was a woman called Peggy Ellis in 1954, and she published it in the prestigious Anti-Locust Bulletin. <laughs> so no, no one that work. In fact, the only reason we know about it is when Peggy died, her family saw that we were interested in locusts and literally you know, sent us all of her papers. Um, so I want to address some key questions here. Why do insects such as locusts exhibit collective motion? We just didn't know at all. Uh, and what biological processes underlie this, both in terms of how it happens and in terms of why it happens? Okay, so I told you that these flying swarms are incredibly difficult to control. <laughs> but fortunately for us, this is some 10 months footage from my lab in Oxford before I moved to Princeton. Uh, and you can see the little locusts hatching out. They're only a few millimeters long at this stage, maybe about half a centimeter long. And they'll dry themselves out and start to march. But notice they don't have wings. In fact, locusts only develop wings in the final stage of their life. So for approximately two months, they are completely wingless. And this is the, what's called hopper band. It's now thought to be the stage that we really need to understand for control measures, because these bands inevitably precede the flying swarm. And so they're not the smartest animals out there. So we put them in this annulus arena, a sort of locust accelerator. And I developed a software to track the motion of all of the individuals simultaneously, so we could track them for eight hours a day, which is a typical marching day in the life of a locust. And they sort of think they're in this never-ending desert environment. And taking all of those trajectory data, we can reduce it down to what we call an order parameter. So this order parameter goes from one to minus one. One means all of the locusts are marching clockwise in the arena. Minus one means they're all marching counterclockwise in the arena. And when it's close to zero, it means there's an equal number approximately going in each direction. And so for low densities, if you look at eight hours worth of data, low densities of locusts on the left, you can see it's a bit of a mess. It's a little bit like particles in a gas bumping into each other, but there's no coherent motion. However, as we increase the density of the insect, we can see here that the system goes counterclockwise, then suddenly flips to clockwise, then flips to counterclockwise in what we call intermittency. 
And as we increase the density further still, in this particular experiment, they went clockwise for the entire eight hours of the experiment. And so we were thinking about this and thought, well, how can we try to understand you know, how density is affecting the collective dynamics? Because locusts are always around. It's only really when you get this vast, dense bands of insects moving through your farmland that it devastates your livelihood. And so we were inspired by work that's been going on for really quite some time in physical systems to understand phase transitions in physical systems, such as in a ferrous magnetic material, uh, when the particles are all aligned, like shown on the right, the, 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 uh, the ferrous magnet shows its magnetic properties. However, as you heat it up uh, to the Curie point, you sort of, you're adding thermal noise to each of these particles, and very suddenly, if you reach this, this temperature, the disorder spreads across the entire system. And so what we know from physics um, when dealing with these types of phase transitions is that lots of the details at the individual level do not matter in terms of understanding the macroscopic collective dynamics. So we asked whether we could think of and model locusts as mobile magnetic particles. And there's also sort of interesting physics here, and this was introduced by a guy called Tamas Vyshek, um, a very simple model in which individual particles tend to align with local neighbors, and the one difference here, uh, compared to a, a simulating an XY system in physics, is that these particles can move. And that has lots of very, very interesting properties for the, the kinetics of this phase transition. Things like the Merman Wagner theorem go out of the window, and there's a lot still to be learned even with these very simple toy models. And so we can then represent uh, virtual workers marching around our arena and ask, you know, despite the fact we've thrown out a lot of uh, the details at the individual level, can we still explain this phase-like transition? And this is just showing you uh, a few uh, images from these simulation results. And we find that we had a very good quantitative match to our data. We had to tell the simulation, you know, we determined this experimentally, that locusts interact over around 12 to 15 centimeters. Um, and we had to fit a noise parameter, but that was basically it. And so unfortunately, there's, there's a lot of light coming through at the top image there. But what each of these points is now eight hours worth of data, condensed to each is one experiment, one day's worth of experiment. And we have the density of locusts here, and in that top figure, we have the total time spent in that ordered phase, in that kind of fluid moving phase. And you can see it increasing as density increases. And here you can see the total number of direction changes increasing and then decreasing as density increases. And this is exactly what's predicted by these uh, particle-based models. So this gave us a lot of insight into how local interactions among these locusts scales to large-scale behavior, how interactions over 12 to 15 centimeters can scale to swarms that exist over hundreds of square kilometers. But it didn't tell us anything about why the locusts were tending to align their direction of travel with neighbors. And we've done a bunch of work on this over the last sort of five or six years. And I don't have time to talk about uh, any of, uh, you know, not, I mean, only a part of it today. I do want to highlight that a lot of this work was with a graduate student who was actually an undergraduate of mine in my lab in Oxford and continued to do her PhD with me, Stephanie Fazazi. So when I was doing those previous experiments, looking at those locusts running around the arena, I would put the locusts in in the morning, and then my postdoc, Jerome Buell, would take them out in the late afternoon or early evening. And you know, I was going to put in, say, 110 insects, and Jerome would come and say, Ian, you know, you counted wrong, you know, there were only 108. I was like, God damn it, you know, I should be able to do this. And you know, this kept on happening, and I thought, am, am I going insane? Are they escaping? And there's no way they could be escaping. But what I found when going back to the videos, this was completely not what we were looking for, um, a chance observation. Um, we found that the locusts were always nipping and biting each other. And in actual fact, there was a huge uh, you know, amount of aggression among these apparently vegetarian insects. And you'd see, you know, in some cases, limited damage, but for desert insects, this is very very, uh, uh, I mean, this, this can have huge consequences. And in this, in, in this case, this work is, is not going to survive. And so what we did to address this was we performed experiments where we cut a little hole into the belly of a locust, and we located the nerve that gives it sensation to the abdomen, how it feels that biting behavior on, it, on the abdomen. And we could cut that nerve 
So we could have swarms of insects that couldn't feel the biting behavior. And of course, we also had controls where we located the nerve and we tickled it, but we did not cut it. And then we could close this little window and seal it up with wax. And these are tough little creatures. And they, you know, we, their behavior wasn't uh, altered in any way in isolation by this. However, when we put them together to see how they swarmed, swarms of nerve cut insects shown in red here didn't swarm. We basically removed their capacity to swarm. And they were behaving as if they were just groups of completely independently uh, behaving uh, actors. Um, whereas uh, groups that could feel this biting behavior swarm. Um, we also did experiments where we manipulated the visual system of locusts. So the top shows a locust with its normal, beautiful red eye there. And in B, what we've done is, you know, so it's not the most high-tech experiment we've ever done, but it was effective. We painted the front half of the eye with black model paint. So these locusts cannot see those ahead. They can only see those behind. In C, these locusts have the back part of the eye painted, so they cannot see behind, they can only see those ahead. And in D, these poor locusts are completely blind. And what we find is that this is how blind swarms behave, and this, which is statistically indistinguishable from this, this is how insects that cannot see those behind behave. So if you cannot feel biting from behind, and you cannot see others approaching you from behind, you don't swarm. And we also found that there was a slight pull around a fifth of the force to, towards those ahead of you. So I went out to Africa to try to understand this because we try to link together the work that we do in the lab with what's going on in the field. Um, and you know, I, I traveled uh, across the desert and we did find locusts, which is actually more of a challenge than you may think in, in such a country. Um, and you can see here, um, footprints in the sand with locusts behind me, that's me filming them. And that's one of my Mauritanian colleagues, and that's our camel. And it's not often that I do field research with a camel, so I do quite attached to it. Um, but unfortunately, it turns out that I'm not very good at doing field work, because I hadn't, I mean, it's so obvious in retrospect, but given that there's a locust plague, there was also a famine. So even though I had plenty of euros and dollars, there was no food to buy. We were completely dependent on passing nomadic uh, tribes people, and so all we could get for a ludicrous amount of money uh, were camel entrails, not from our camel, our camel was not harmed. So <laughs> you can see a fly laying its eggs inside this. We dried the little trees till it became a jerky. I'd been a vegetarian for a decade prior to this trip. Um, it actually didn't taste all that bad, but I became horribly ill. Um, for about two weeks, I, I couldn't work. It was hallucinating, not, not, not only good, but it was really awful. And, um, and then, you know, when I finally got better, you can see how well prepared I was. You can see this is my $50 tent. They laughed when I put this one up. And, you know, we're resourceful biologists. We're also drying our clothes in the same tree behind the, the dirt here. And this is my Mauritanian college tent. What you're seeing in the background there is a sandstorm moving towards us. <laughs> Just brilliant. And um, this is not a sandstorm. This is the sandstorm that I took from NASA's website that collected to Africa. That literally blew the locusts away. And it knocked down my colleague's tent. Mine, mine stayed up, thankfully. <laughs> uh, but so two months, uh, two months out in the desert, 20 minutes worth of data, I will never go there again. <laughs> <laughs> we, decided, we decided to come to you know, good old US of A where they have things like roads and study a comparable system. These are Mormon crickets. Um, I mean, some of you may have seen these swarms of Mormon crickets. And you can see one chiming down on the buddy, but it's dangerous to stop, so it will drag it along and try and climb up something to get away from the swarm to eat it. So again, these apparently vegetarian insects would frequently eat roadkill, they're crawling into the eyes and the mouth of this little bunny, and they've almost completely eaten its ears off. Um, kind of gruesome creatures, they also eat each other. And so you would sort of expect that we used artificial diets. P stands for protein, C stands for carbohydrate, and the, the O stands for a neutral diet that's got no nutritional value whatsoever. And you would naively expect that insects would go for a carbohydrate-based diet. But what we found was, as we added more and more protein, the crickets had a stronger preference for it. Um, and similarly with salt, I, I love this video here. This is like a living Instagram. Of course, I randomized it when I did these experiments. This was just the show for talk. So we have water here, an increase in salt concentration up to two molar salt concentration. They taste it with their feet and you can see them fighting over 0.25 molar. 
which they have a, a very strong preference for. But of course, you may not be surprised to know that that's exactly the concentration of their blood. And so they're finally tuned to a cannibalistic lifestyle. And so we have a sort of new mechanism for collective motion that we call a forced march. This looks like a, some sort of cooperative behavior. But remember, these are selfish individuals. And in this case, it's really uh, eat others or be eaten. Um, individuals attack those ahead and try to prevent themselves from being attacked from behind, stop, and you risk being cannibalized. And if you saw me deftly switching to a completely unrelated species from locusts to the Mormon cricket, I don't have time to talk about it, but we did go back uh, and show in, in 2011 that this same mechanism also explains the locust swarm. And I just want to highlight again why this is important, because we didn't have any understanding of how and why these swarms initially start. And yet the region that's, this is the, the latest from the FAO, the region that currently has to be assessed for locusts is vast. And so hopefully we can now move towards hyperspectral imaging from satellite data, now that we understand about the key driving processes. Now elsewhere in nature, we see collective behavior among individuals that perhaps thankfully are not all trying to eat each other. So if we look at fish schools here, you can see that you can't use verbal arguments to explain how local interactions scale to these types of collective behavior. And as a biologist, I want to try and get inside the head of the individual to see what's going on, how it coordinates its activity. And so when I started this, there was no data, not just a dearth of data, there was no data. And so one of the first ways to approach this is to build computational models, agent-based models as Mark was saying. And so here we have individuals that exist at certain positions, centroid, individual I exists at centroid I at time T, and it has a velocity. And then we can speculate how type, general types of social interactions scale to collective behavior. For example, if individuals become too closely associated with each other, this causes them to, to move them apart. For birds in flight, it can actually be fatal to collide. We can also speculate that if individuals become isolated, it's dangerous to leave the group, and so individuals may exhibit a tendency to be attracted to each other, or like the locusts, they may also have a tendency to align their velocity, to align their direction of travel with near neighbors. And this was inspired, as Mark said, by a groundbreaking uh, model by Craig Reynolds called Boyd, which unfortunately, I don't have the best video of this. Uh, Craig and I created a video for Wired magazine a couple of weeks ago, and he's, he's much nicer than this. But I still think this looks incredibly contemporary. And there really hasn't been um, much advance beyond this in terms of the mathematics of the modeling. And so what these models do is they allow us to represent local interactions among these individuals and to see how it scales up to collective properties at the group level. But before I come back to the types of patterns that these models generate, I want to ask another question. I mentioned just now that individuals want to be attracted to each other perhaps to, to minimize risk. It's dangerous to leave the group. But we really don't have any good quantitative understanding about how risk of predation results in potentially the evolution of collective motion. So how does risk select for these types of individual level interactions? For example, you, you may be attracted towards other individuals. As I mentioned, you may tend to align your direction of travel with near neighbors. And you may also have a balance. You may exhibit both attraction and repulsion. And the problem here is, you know, what about different uh, behavioral strategies within the same group? The individuals look identical, but they may have different strategies. And I can't go and tell an animal, you just show attraction and you just show alignment, and I'll put you out there and let's see if you get killed first. You know, we can't do that. And so this has really been a challenge for 30 or 40 years to try to understand, is this really an important issue? So how can we ask questions about risk and the type of social interactions exhibited by individuals in groups? Well, we came up with the idea to allow real predators to hunt and exert selection pressure on virtual prey populations. So to sort of link together the simulated model and the real world. And this was published uh, late last year. And so, uh, and this was picked up by, by lots of press uh, about how we 
in the video games were fixed, which is kind of true. Of course, the economists are very serious, but the rest of them, the rest of them were a bit more fun. Well, my, my, my favorite was this, was this quote here. <laughs> well, at least because there's some truth to that, because we did come up with the idea of, of not that particular one. Um, and so, um, so we used a generalist predator called a bluegill sunfish. And these are really cool little fish. So what we're going to do is project a sort of zooplankton swarm onto a thin translucent film in the tank. The reason it's translucent is we want to film through that to see the fish approaching and to see which individual is targeting. And the nice thing about bluegills is that they'll leave, and they're like a little attack helicopter. They'll go out there, and they will just hover, and they will target, and then they will strike. So we can use that little hovering tank as a proxy for how difficult it is for them to lock on to a specific target. Now, with the light coming in here, there's nothing I can do about it, I'm afraid. You're probably not going to see much here. But there are little, little red zooplankton-like dots that we're simulating um, that, it, that have different uh, social interactions. Does it change, does it change the light? Um, I think it's sunlight. Yeah, I think there's, there's not much I can do about that, unfortunately. <laughs> but you can perhaps see that the little fish came out, and just near its mouth there, you might see a little light dot. And that's one of these little simulated plankton. And these plankton have different interactions, and we don't prescribe what your interaction should be. And we use hundreds of fish, they each attack once, because we don't want them to... Oh, oh, oh how, 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 how very clever. Okay, let me, uh, let me zip through this. So unfortunately, it's embedded in the same slide, so I have to go through this again. Okay, so now we can get to the movie. So now you can hopefully see little red dots. Um, and this, this is the color that they, that they really find very attractive. And it doesn't look quite this red when we project it. And shortly, we're going to go to the actual experiment, where we're going to see uh, these little dots on this translucent screen, and we're looking through the screen, the fish is coming towards us, and in this particular instance, it's going to go for that isolated individual in the middle. And because we know the random number generator we use, <laughs> and the time step, we, we run the simulation, and we work out what was your behavioral strategy, and we then give that individual a fitness cost, and we allow this population to evolve. And we find very strong selection pressure. This is the risk. So being completely isolated is, is a very bad thing, as you saw from that video. But we find that selection um, didn't just select for attraction to comp specific, it also uh, selected for orientation. So you need a balance of alignment and attraction to survive. And so the virtual prey, now these prey were not responsive to the predator, because zooplankton uh, cannot detect that first attack. Uh, we're now working on systems that allow the prey to be responsive. Um, and we think this is because it really costs that predator, cognitive, it's a cognitive cost, it's difficult for them to target within these types of groups. Um, but of course, you know, in many other systems, um, the prey can respond to the predator, they can detect the predator and respond to it. And so we've also been doing experiments with other systems, such as schooling fish, that I don't have time to talk about uh, today, but I did want to show you that it's pretty cool. We've been working with a new type of sonar imaging called Dixon, which has got two centimeters spatial resolution and around 10 hertz. And so we can look in this case at Gulf of Hagen being attacked by spotted sea trout. Um, and again, you know, when we're not just looking at these pretty movies, we've developed software that can track the motion of the prey and the predators to see how they interact. And we find that collective behavior is critical for information propagation among the prey. But it's also critical for the predators who have to form big, long lines to try to slice up these prey schools to deal with the collective information transfer issue. And so really what I want to start you know, thinking about is you know, even though these are unrelated organisms, can you think of these groups as some form of collective mind of these different cognitive capabilities coming together? Is there such a thing as collective cognition in animal groups? Now, returning to the simulations that I described before, the ones that were inspired by Craig's uh, Boyd simulation, where you have this repulsion, orientation, and attraction, we found when we analyzed that model, there turned out to be fundamentally three different sort of states of matter. And the cool thing about this is it doesn't matter exactly how you implement this model. 
the collective behavior is very robust to the assumption. And so we have this swarm-like state, this polarized state, and this kind of milling, rotational state. So a little bit like physical systems, where you can have lots of different types of molecular interaction, but again, only fundamental states of matter, such as solid, liquid, gas, and plasma, we find that similar here. And so we wanted to move beyond just being able to show pretty movies that looked a bit like what we see in reality to try to make a clear link between these computational models and reality. So in 2008, um, we discovered the bluegill sunfish. We were actually with Carnegie and Princeton trying to find fish, and it was a nightmare, it's so time consuming. And then I realized the fishermen there have buckets of this little schooling fish called the gold of China, which turns out they're bred for the live bait industry. So for $70, we get a thousand of these fish delivered in a box. And uh, that, was, that was pretty amazing. Um, and we also find that when we look at these real fish stools, and we've studied them for hundreds of hours, we only ever see these three fundamental states of matter that were predicted from these individual based models. Um, but we can, so now we have very sophisticated tracking software and I want to credit Haishin Wu, a postdoc in my group, um, who's developed this really remarkable software that where you have near identical individuals occluding each other, the software does not get confused as to who is who. Um, and this, of course, is just focusing on one individual. But we can, of course, track the motion of all the individuals in a group and also map to their body posture. Um, so it's really um, very, very clever, uh, very clever software. Uh, he just created this movie just before I left Princeton yesterday, just to show you tracking. Uh, this is at the start of the experiment before the, the group really formed. So it just shows you the sort of technologies that we can use to get data from these systems. And when we take all of these data and we reduce it down to the rotation of the group, the angular momentum of the group, and the polarization of the group, how strongly aligned you are, you can see these three hotspots that shows the system basically exists in these three different attractor states and dynamically flips between them. For low rotation and low polarization, we have the swarm. For high rotation and low global polarization, we have the milling state, or the torus state. And for high polarization and low rotation, we have the, the polarized state. So despite the fact there's a lot going on that we do not understand about these fish, despite the fact that our models are deliberately simplified versions of reality, they were still able to capture the core dynamics of this system in a similar way to how physical models allow us to understand these systems. However, we can go a bit beyond that because you know, it's been speculated, for example, in Craig's model and my model, we tend to use for a simplifying approximation that you interact with individuals within a fixed distance from you. Um, more recently, it's been argued in Starling Fox um, that individuals may be interacting not with a fixed metric distance, with individuals within a fixed distance, but maybe interacting with a fixed number of individuals, say seven nearest neighbors, regardless of their absolute distance. It's also been speculated that perhaps you interact with your Voronoi neighbors. But of course, and it's, it's, uh, it kind of blows my mind that we haven't done this already, but of course, you know, the more biologically plausible, and kind of in many ways more interesting uh, possibility is that you're actually interacting with neighbors that you can see, which creates a very interesting topology of interaction. And so we've developed software that not only tracks the motion of our fish, but it automatically calculates where their eyes are. And using GPUs, using optics, and video optics, we can then use ray casting algorithms in real time to reconstruct what each individual can actually see. And we actually reduced massively the number of ray casts um, just for the purposes of illustration here. But I'll show you a, a movie uh, of a fish where we've reconstructed its visual field using this sort of crazy 2D uh, system. Uh, we're also developing this in 3D. The software is working also in 3D. And so we can then use Bayesian model selection techniques to test directly among these different hypotheses about how individuals behave. And we find very strong evidence. Um, this is a, a nonlinear axis here. We find very strong evidence that it's not metric, it's not topological, and it's not Voronoi. Of course, it's really the visual network that's critical. And this network has some extraordinary properties that I don't have time to go into. But I do want to show you, sort of, for the first time, we can now construct a network of interactions 
that not, is not based on some sort of guesswork. It's actually based on the information on the retina of individuals that we know they use for coordinating their behavior, these sorts of sensory networks. And we're very interested in how this leads to collective communication within these groups. And we've also developed a robot predator that allows us to attack and perturb these groups. We're not allowed to work with real predators these days, but we can work with these robots. And so there's an autonomous robot underneath the tank connected to this model through magnetism. Okay, so, you know, so far I've been showing you predominantly how local interactions scale to collective behavior within relatively barren environments. Within environments, you know, big, big, big old empty tanks <coughs> within the lab. But of course, in nature, uh, among cells or um, animals, these are neural crest cells that we're just working from that paper on, that also collectively migrate. They are living in complex environments. So can we begin to understand not only how individuals interact with each other, but how they interact with their environments? And there's a, a large range of different complexities that one could think about. You could think about, for example, a diffusing odor within the ocean. Um, or we could think about maybe um, the height of the landscape is important for individuals to select appropriate habitat. And what is the benefit, if anything, of grouping within these types of environments? And the, the general idea for collective intelligence in animal groups comes from this chap here. Is that one over the sky is? Francis Galton. Good, good one. This is Sir Francis Galton, cousin of Charles Darwin, and a bit of a know it all to me, to be brutally honest. He was an anthropologist, tropical explorer, a geographer, inventor, meteorologist, protogeneticist, slash eugenicist, um, statistician. So he knew a lot of stuff. But fortunately for, for no talk to Francis, he didn't know much about livestock. Um, and this turns out to be important, because in 1906, he was at the livestock fair, and he was a competitive man, and there was a competition to guess the weight of an ox. And so Francis realized that he knew nothing about oxen. But he also realized that almost 800 villagers had already entered the competition and had made their guesses. So he thought to himself, well, perhaps the middlemost estimate expresses the, the voice of the people, the most popular estimate. As we calculated the mean of 1,197 pounds, he was one pound out. <laughs> you know, it's quite remarkable. And really, this is the basis of what people think of as the wisdom of crowds. Individuals making imperfect estimates and somehow pooling them. And of course, the pooling doesn't have to just be the mean. The pooling can be done in other types of sophisticated ways. Um, but that's really how people think about collective intelligence. That's the traditional view. Each individual makes an imperfect estimate. Grouping allows this pooling of estimates, for example, through the alignment term within groups. And in other sort of branches of the literature, this has been called the many wrongs principle. But to my knowledge, this has never ever been tested <coughs> with animal groups to see whether they are actually able to pool these imperfect estimates. <coughs> and so we set up an experiment as follows. So our fish that's shown in both of these images here, that top image, is showing you us putting the fish in an environment that has a complex light gradient. It's going to be a time-varying light gradient. It's like dappled light in a stream, for example. And the fish really like to be in the dark regions. They feel safer there. So we don't have to train them or anything. And they also don't use up this gradient. But because we can't see them when they're in the dark regions, we also film exactly the same scene using infrared light. So this allows us to track the motion of the individuals. So this is the same experiment you're seeing here, invisible light at the top and then infrared light <coughs> at the bottom. Um, and you can see we can isolate the fish from this complex background. But because we know the statistical properties of what we're presenting, we can then remap on. So we now have very detailed information about how individuals interact with each other and also how they interact with their complex environment. And what we found was the first experimental evidence for this wisdom of crowd effects in these types of animal groups. And so as we increase the group size, you can see the capacity for individuals to detect and respond to the gradient increases quite dramatically. So we thought, great, this is, you know, this is going to give us uh, a, a good example of this many wrongs principle. But then when we went to analyze the data in, a more, de in more detail, to analyze, for example, at what range are individuals Protecting their environmental gradients. And how important is that with respect to the social information? 
we came in for a bit of a surprise. We ended up finding out that individuals were not capable of detecting the environmental gradient. They, were, they just weren't capable of doing that. They were only responding to each other. And so this confused us greatly. If individuals cannot detect the gradient in any way, how on earth is the group capable of detecting the gradient? And of course, you know, when, when you look at, you know, the wonderful thing about studying these real systems is that there are these beautiful surprises, because of course the algorithm that you're using is remarkably simple. They are simply adjusting their speed according to the local light level. They're moving slower in darker regions and faster in lighter regions. And so they are adjusting their speed based exclusively on a scalar measure. They do not have any directional sense of the gradient. They just know what is the environment like exactly where I am. So they're not using memory and they're not using integration in space. And yet, collectively, they can sense the environment. Because if individuals reach a dark region, they slow down, and because of the sort of elastic-like forces between the fish, this then causes the group to kind of swing in. And we also found another important factor was that, like cars on a highway, when you slow down, you spontaneously become clustered. And when you spontaneously become clustered, the attraction vectors tend to be pointed predominantly towards individuals in clusters. So the collective, as long as the collective gets large enough to span, to reach the environmental length scale, so this local noise, there are these local minima that you get trapped in if the group is too small. But if the group is large enough to create a sensor array of the scale of the information, the long range information in the environment, you can see that suddenly they can detect it. You can also see it dropping off. If the groups get too large beyond the length scale in the environment, they also do relatively poorly, which is kind of interesting to ask whether groups spontaneously adjust group size to, to match the environmental conditions. So it's something we're testing at the moment. <coughs> and so since it doesn't rely on individuals to assess the gradients, this is a really minimal uh, capability. And in fact, we've now working with control theorists, we've been able to prove that this will always find the global optimum within a very wide range of different environment types. So it's really close to optimal strategy at the collective level. And of course, when strategies relating to sensing or collective migration, you know, that this, this taxis doesn't exist at the individual level. It only exists at the level of the collective. It's a true emergent uh, phenomenon. Um, this could have control implications for managing these populations. And the mechanism itself is incredibly robust. So I don't have time to go into it, but we looked at different types of noise. And this mechanism is, it, both experimentally and in our model, is extremely robust. Okay, in the last part of the talk, I want to talk about leadership and decision making within groups. So, I mean, so again, I'm showing you pictures of fish, but you can think more broadly about cells or birds or, or even robots. Um, and so, you know, individuals may have information. They may have goal-oriented behavior. So this individual may know, for example, the direction towards a food source that the others don't know about. Does that have to signal to others? I know what's going on. Follow me. The others have to recognize who has information and who does not. And does that make any sense in evolutionary terms among selfish individuals? Well, firstly, we have no evidence for this biologically. So we started off with a very simple model that simulates the social tendencies, much as I showed you before. But now we have some individuals within the group that have goal-oriented behavior. Now, importantly, I am going to color in the individuals with information in bright colors so we can see what's going on. But in the model, we start at random positions, random orientations, and there's no way of inferring the informational status of others. You only know what you want to happen, what you want to do. And individuals with goal-oriented behavior reconcile their social tendency, their schooling tendency, with their goal-oriented tendency using a weighting term that we call omega. If omega is very low, then the goal-oriented behavior, you're not very hungry, you don't want to risk leaving the group, that goal-oriented behavior only has a very small role to play. However, if you become very hungry, or, or you know, if individuals are really intransigent to change, really unwilling to give up on their opinion, then we can simulate that with a large omega. So initially we wanted to ask, can information be transferred in groups without signaling and without individual recognition? So if you have one, five, or ten informed individuals in a group of a hundred, you can see one individual that's colored white there, trying to guide the group on the x-axis, is not able to do so. Five individuals, however, after an initial period of reorganization where they tend to occupy the front of the group, 
the information kind of gets transferred correctly, and they, they move sort of in the right direction. Um, but with 10 informed individuals, suddenly and spontaneously, the information is transferred. And we can quantify the accuracy of information transfer as a function of the proportion of informed individuals. And for all group sizes, you see this increases asymptotically as we increase the proportion of informed individuals. However, if we look at, say, 85% accuracy and the smallest group size, a group of 10, you can see that for that level of accuracy, we need around half of the individuals to have information. However, for large groups, such as a group of 200, for the same level of accuracy, we now only need 5% of the individuals to have information. And for very large groups, such as cell sheets, you know, it looks as if everybody is, has information about the environment. But it could actually be an infinitesimal number that actually have this direct motion. And we can also test these ideas experimentally. This is not a simulation. These are real data where we have trained individuals colored in red. We detect them with little fluorescent tags and untrained individuals. And we get exactly the types of behavior that we see within our model. But so far, all of my leaders have been in agreement with each other about where to go. What about if there's disagreement within the group? Can the group come to a collective consensus to decide where to go? And I don't have time to talk about the, the model here. I want to move on to some newer stuff. But I'll just show you some movies. Here there's 10 individuals want to get to the white target and 10 to the red target. And the green ones are uninformed. In this case, they choose the red. But it's 50-50. But if I add just one more white individual, I hope these sort of see the local noisy nature of the interaction. But now they will almost always, over 95% of the time, they will reach the target preferred by the majority. And of course, these individuals cannot count. They are performing this computation through the kinematics of their motion. But if you're really unwilling to give up on your opinion, if you have very high omega, then you can no longer come to consensus. <laughs> and groups will tend to split apart. I'm just going to discuss the consensus part, which is pretty large regional family. Really. So, you know, this is looking at differing opinions within, within fish schools and herding animals and bird flocks. But we also have differing opinions within uh, our own collectives. Com competing interests or conflicting interests are very, very common. And yet failing to achieve a consensus can be very costly. If you're on a hiring committee and you can never decide what to do, that's disastrous. Or if you're on an environmental change committee and you can never come up with a policy, that's disastrous. So there are many scenarios where consensus is very important. And individuals may be susceptible to manipulation by a strongly opinionated or an extremist minority under some context. And in the social sciences, without any data whatsoever, to my knowledge, um, it's been suggested that individuals who are uninformed, who have weak preferences, are particularly vulnerable to manipulation by strongly opinionated agents. And one way that humans have got around this, and it's sort of independently emerged from cultures across the globe, is by voting. In voting, it doesn't matter how strongly I believe in something. I have the same say as you, as you, as you. So we have this equal representation through voting. But does that make any sense for animal or cellular aggregates, where individuals have limited means of conveying a vote, no global overview of votes, only relatively local interactions? But recall the movies I just showed you. They are effectively voting here. Even though they're not explicitly doing it, they're very good at effectively voting. And so, as I said before, if we have a majority versus a minority, the, ma the majority will tend to win out. However, you may ask yourself, if these are selfish individuals, what's stopping that minority just becoming increasingly opinionated, having a higher omega? And if we simulate these types of groups where everybody has information, and I'm just showing you one group size, I'll extend this to any group size in a moment, but if everybody has information, and say I fix the majority preference strength to 0.3, and then I look to see what happens when I change the minority. If the minority also had a strength of 0.3, as I said before, the majority will win nearly 100% of the time, and they'll reach the majority target. However, as the minority becomes increasingly intransigent, unwilling to give up on their direction of travel, you can see that when they reach 50-50, half of the time they reach the minority target, and half of the time they reach the majority target. But if the minority becomes increasingly opinionated, they can begin to completely dictate the dynamics of the group. So being opinionated seems to be a useful strategy. It does come at the cost of groups potentially splitting, but otherwise, it can work. However, this was the case where everybody in the group had information. 
What about if some individuals in the group are either uninformed or they are possibly well informed, but they just don't care what the outcome is? Well, then everything changes. So here, we are now looking at the number of uninformed individuals on the x-axis. And the minority has a stronger preference than the majority, 0.38 versus 0.3. It's not so strong. In fact, for no uninformed individuals, the majority still wins around 60% of the time. But look what happens when I put in 10 stupid individuals. It pushes the control to the majority even further before it then saturates out due to the local interaction. But I can increase the strength of minority preference further and further still, now with no uninformed individuals in the group, the minority almost always wins. But put in 10 individuals that don't care what happens, and control goes back to the majority. So they're reinforcing the democratic view within the collective. Now this is, is interesting because it can tell us something about why we don't see perhaps very strongly opinionated individuals in nature. Um, but we also want to ask, is this a general principle? You know, there are many systems in which individuals can influence and be influenced by others. There are technological systems, there are neuronal systems, and of course there are social systems. And so to get a first look at this, we can get rid of a lot of the complexity. So we're moving away from an explicit swarm simulation. We're moving towards what's called a Berta model, where we can simulate individuals existing on a network and edges representing interactions between these individuals. And we're just going to consider discrete binary opinions. But this also works for a larger number of opinions. I'm just not going to present that here. And for time constraints, I'm just going to look at what we call the adaptive network model. We also did one from the social sciences as well. And this is with Thilo Gross and Gerben Demerer. And so in the adaptive network model, as I said, individuals are represented as nodes on a network, and edges represent interactions. So it's a real abstracted version of reality again. And so just to give you an example, here we just have two nodes and the line denotes an interaction. This one thinks red is best, and this one thinks green is best. And there's a slight probability that the green one will change the red one's opinion and vice versa. In this case, it doesn't happen. The red sticks with its opinion. But then later on, it interacts with two green individuals. Now, this is a slight synergistic effect. So if the probability of changing your opinion of interacting with one is Q, this has to be greater than two, slightly greater than two Q. That's all you need mathematically for this to work. And of course, you know, I'm showing you a trivial example with three nodes. We simulate 10,000 10, nodes. So in this case, this individual thinks red is best. Uh, these individuals disagree. And they have a higher probability, but it's still probabilistic, of changing this individual's opinion. But of course, we simulate this over a very large number of agents mm -hmm. in a network. And what we find is if the majority and minority have equal strength of opinion, the majority wins. However, if we increase the opinion strength of the minority, they can, as we saw in the swarm model, dominate the decision-making of the entire population. And as we add uninformed individuals, well, initially, nothing happens. But then we reach a tipping point, where a tiny fraction of nodes in that network that don't care what happens completely change the dynamics of the system, and now the majority tends to. So a tiny fraction of individuals that don't care what the outcome is can have a dramatic impact on the population uh, decision. And the nice thing about the adaptive network model is I'll just show you simulation results. But with Tilo and Gerben, we've been able to use uh, a moment uh, extraction, a moment close opinion to actually prove this result, to create an analytical version. And really, this was, this was their work. I mean, pretty, pretty hairy, hairy stuff. But the nice thing is we can now understand better why we see this. Because the, 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 the circles represent the numerical simulations and the lines represent the proof, the analytical model. And you can see that below a critical density of uninformed individuals, there is only one stable attractor. The, the minority have to win. But then as we get above a critical density of uninformed nodes in our network, we have what's called a saddle node bifurcation and the appearance of a stable majority state, and the system flips to that state. And there's also an unstable, undecided state. Um, and so the nice thing about this is now, you know, you, I don't have to run tens of thousands of simulations anymore. We can look at the important factors here, the relative strength of minority preference versus the numerical advantage of the majority. And you can see here that when everybody in this network has a preference, when everybody is opinionated, you can see you know, minority, if they're sufficiently opinionated, can dominate the dynamic. 
But that, again, is when everybody has information or when everybody has a bias. If we put uninformed individuals into the population, I'm going to show you the region of parameter space that flips from minority control to the majority control. And I'm going to color it in white. And you can see it's chromatic. So being strongly opinionated now for a minority only works in this tiny little sliver of parameter space. It just cannot work uh, in these types of populations. And I'm not making any judgment regarding whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. You can see this in different ways. And these, of course, are very abstracted models at the moment. But we've also shown this in models of neurons. Um, we've also shown this in icing type models, spin system models in physics, where we're going to publish. And so we do conjecture that this could be widespread. And you know, one cool thing about it is you know, I'm a biologist. I don't really believe anything unless I can do an experiment to test it. And the next thing here is we have a sort of counterintuitive but testable prediction that uninformed individuals should inhibit the influence of a strongly opinionated minority and return control to the numerical majority. And if I go back to my swarm model, my model of schooling, the cool thing is it works for very small absolute numbers of uninformed individuals, which means this is potentially tractable experimentally. And so that's exactly what we did. We returned to our little golden shyness, these beautiful little fish that we work on, and we can then train individuals to have a preference for a blue target, and it's Christos Wanu, my postdoc, that did these experiments. You can train them to have a preference for a blue target or a yellow target, and then like running a simulation, you just let them go. It just takes a hell of a lot longer to get your replicates with the real biological system. It took three months to get three data points. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's worth doing. And we used um, what's called an intrinsic color-based learning bias that is present in fish, such as every fish and these, these, these little guys and girls. And that is that even for the same amount of training, they have a much stronger preference for yellow to blue, presumably because they don't see much blue in their natural environment. So we could use that learning bias to bias our results such that the minority uh, were always uh, going for the yellow target. So they had that strong preference, and the majority a less strong preference for the blue target. So the minority tends to win. But if we add five and then 10 untrained, uninformed individuals, as predicted by our theory, we flip control from minority control back to majority control. And so uninformed individuals inhibit extremism and promote democratic consensus decision-making within these groups. And so I hope to have shown you, you know, by looking at groups such as locusts and crickets, and schooling fish, and I didn't have time to talk about the work in the human crime, that we're beginning to, ex linking together experiments and theory, we're beginning to understand some core principles that underlie collective behavior in these different systems. And I'd like to thank you all very much for coming, in, and I'll be very happy to take questions. So in 
in terms of hydrodynamic interaction between fish and stool, for these small freshwater fish that we work on, there is no evidence of any hydrodynamic interaction. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, which is great for us, but this was done by George Lauder at Harvard, who's a real expert at fish hydrodynamics, did the 3D PIV for shyness and for all the other fish we work on. And they were very disappointed. They spent about nine years doing this and find no evidence of hydrodynamic interaction in school. But for us, it's great. And also, we can show that it's the visual network that, that's critical. However, you know, what's really interesting about that is that if you put a slight current, a slight environmental current in the water, the fish will polarize to it. So they, they are seemingly very, very receptive and responsive to environmentally generated flows. But they are apparently actually filtering out self-generated which is kind of, kind of interesting. Now that's not the case for other species of fish. Some pelagic fish, they definitely use hydrodynamic interaction. But for all of the freshwater species that they looked at, I think eight, they find no evidence, which is great for us, but not so great if you're interested in hydrodynamics. So I'm thinking about a jury and political activism. Right. And it, I wonder <coughs> if a jury is an example of introducing 12 uninformed individuals who then can sort of grease the uh, process of having people who are advocates, who are polarized as advocates, to reach a resolution that's acceptable. That's one thought. Yeah. The other thought, a uh, really separate issue is, imagine I'm part of a committed minority and I'm trying to create social change like combat global warming or gun control or gun rights or whatever. When is it in my interest to have people less informed versus more informed? So, so there's, there's, there's some subtleties uh, to this. These are both uh, really important questions. That, you know, I, I want to emphasize first that these models are deliberately abstracted. You know, that they're, they're, they're models really that we're, we're, we're moving towards trying to understand more complex systems. So at the moment, they're, they're abstracted. But we are setting up jury experiments with students where we can change the, the degree to which individuals have information and so on. But another important issue here is that our individuals are not necessarily uninformed. They could be very well informed. And the other issue is that they are participating in the decision-making process. In other cases in humans, you know, on humans in particular, uninformed individuals may not have the opportunity to participate. Here, these individuals are following the same rules, they are participating in the decision, they just don't care what the outcome is. Right, so that's an important so potential it's important. Uninformed, uncommitted, or un un uh, no parents. Yeah, or unbiased, so we describe them as uninformed because in the case of the fish, the easiest way to test it is by putting in individuals that are uninformed. And you know, in, in nature, because of the fish and fusion dynamics of these groups, individuals may not have heard this information. However, we also call it unbiased. So you know, in the paper, we make clear that you, you could be very well informed, just not care what the outcome is. And so, but you know, intuitively, it might be, you know, it might be that you know, if you have these two fractions that really cannot be eyes wide, and you get this fragmentation effect of, <coughs> of opinion space, you know, having individuals that don't have biases may act like some form of conduit, like we find in our models, allowing the system to maintain cohesive uh, and to come to consensus more easily. But that, at the moment, is mm -hmm. an untested speculation that we have to test in experiments in, 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 in other systems. Um, oh, I'm wondering, when you take your consensus network models and if you add some sort of a mean field global variable of information that can be transferred So sig signals coming in from the outside. Or, or even something more about the group, like everyone I mean, we so talk to each other and we also get like news reports. So, so if, you, if you have a look at the paper and the supplement, we also develop a mean field approximation for this. So that's sort of going towards that. And we've also done um, modifications of this, but we also have an external um, external information from the institute. But there's, there's more to be done for sure. It's a good, good point. So I'm curious how an adaptive trait that relates to plus and leader can tweak to a population. Maybe it's part of the evolution where So, so uh, the question is about you know, the evolution of these behaviors. And so it really depends on what, what system you're looking at. So say, for example, the gradient climbing here, where it's really almost a mutual partner, right? You know, it benefits everybody if the groups get larger and protect that. So in that case, it's, it's relatively easy to see how it works. But in many other cases, you have more of a producer-scrounger type dynamics, where if individuals 
for example, uh, gaining information from the environment, others can then use cheaper socially facilitated, but they don't have to waste their time getting information from the environment. So I think you have to, I mean, one has to be careful about exactly which questions one, one is addressing with these. But certainly these, these uh -huh. dynamics, um, but the one thing that's always sort of struck me as potentially important is, you know, as you say, for, for many evolutionary arguments, you need a certain frequency of individuals within the population before it can stop, before it can, it can spread. And you know, people would, would argue that, well, you know, how can you explain you know, reaching that critical you know, threshold? Well, in these kind of fission-fusion populations, it's like a self-stirring um, sort of system. Any differences among individuals, if, you know, if your genotype is associated with your phenotype in pretty much any way at all, you will spontaneously become associated with other genotypes through that phenotypic assault. So it's sort of self-sorting process. So really subtle differences. It's like, you know, if you put like a drop of milk in your coffee, it takes like two days to get in the day and a half to diffuse. If you stir it, it diffuses with you spontaneously. These groups are sort of self-stirring. And so I think that there's huge capacity by taking into account the sort of physics of these groups for individuals with rare um, with rare genotypes or rare phenotypes to actually find each other in population and to kick off this process. Um, but it's not it's not really from the study, to be honest. People are people are not often linking together evolutionary theory with the sort of the physical principles of self organization. And that's something we're trying to do. here is that in bacterial systems you, you can get a lot of uh, collective dynamic behaviors and evolution and you're, you're absolutely right. And so I've, I've kind of, I mean, uh, many of my friends like Kevin Foster and uh, people, you know, study these types of dynamics. And people are now getting to the point with imaging that you can actually look at the spatial dynamics as well, which is where things get very exciting. So we, we have a collaboration <coughs> with Bassler at Princeton looking into some of these collective behaviors in relation to form sensing. And, um, so, so I think it's an extremely exciting area. Not one that I, I work in myself, I'm kind of busy with some more microscopic systems, but it's extremely interesting. So there's two people in direct line of sight there. I don't, you can fight that among yourselves. <laughs> I can take you in secret. Can you um, briefly talk about your experiment with human crabs? Okay, so just to summarize what we did there, we were inspired by Milgram, these classic experiments by Milgram, where he got people, students, to look up at a, a window, a third uh, floor window in New York, and then he was interested in how many people also look up. Um, and those ex experiments um, have been argued to be a tipping point within these tribes. You know, you get what this looks like, this very non-linear function. But if you look at this paper, there's only there's no error bars because you only did each experiment once in one, in one morning. Um, and it's kind of funny that people just sort of take that for granted, but no one's gone back to revisit that. So we did experiments um, in, in Oxford where we repeated Milgram's experiments, but we tracked the motion of all of the individuals. So we could look at the spatial dynamics. And we then, um, so we analyzed this in great detail, and we then compared, we then took Milgram's data and fit into a model that we mapped to our data, we could show that that was completely a misinterpretation of Milgram's data. There is no tipping point, there's no non-linearity. It's, 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 it's an artifact of the way the data were presented. And then we, um, then we were interested in, but there is a collective effect, and then we were interested in um, detecting apparent behavior in crowds. Now if you're trying to pick out that one individual, let's say for example doing reconnaissance difficult because there's so much individual variation. So we put in individuals in natural crowds that were surreptitiously filming and taking notes. They weren't really filming, but tending to. Um, and we found that in, in, in a shopping street, people would tend to look more at those individuals, but of course due to bystander apathy, they wouldn't ever do anything about it. Um, and within groups, we find that males were more likely to initially detect the stimulus, but females were more likely to propagate within group the stimulus. So in actual fact, groups with mixed sexes were, mo were overall most sensitive. But, um, and so this sort of, the idea is, you know, can we use the, the, the head movement behavior to sort of guide us towards where we might want to look? Then we did the experiments in uh, a station, a main railway station in London, and we found the opposite. We found that there was a halo of not looking around the suspicious individuals compared to control individuals. And then, and then looking at the, the, the sex again, this was driven by a, 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 a ratio bias. 
There were more males. This was like a commuter station. And just at that time of day, you know, we did experiments with it at a fixed time of day over multiple days. There were more males, and it was the males that were averting their attention. In both scenarios, women were looking more often at this group. And so, um, and so, but we could show, and then we've done experiments in Princeton, where if, if you look at gaze copying behavior in the psychology literature, it's exclusively face-to-face -face interactions, either looking at a computer screen, with a simulated scenario, or a video, or a real person. What we find in natural scenarios is face-to-face -face interactions inhibit gaze copying. And what you're actually adapted to do is to copy the gaze of the back of people's heads. And the idea there is, of course, you know, if, if you're copying the behavior of individuals that are in front of you, they're experiencing the world that you're about to experience. And so we can show that there's a sort of, we can also show that groups are much better at detecting sort of apparent stimuli under those conditions. And so there's this anisotropic spread of gaze copying that spreads backwards in crowded environments. And a paper we're about to submit shows that if the, if the gaze, uh, if we modify the expression, the emotion of an individual, so we use act, uh, actors, um, where you know, they can have a happy face, uh, uh, an anxious face, uh, a scared face, or a control expression, we find that individuals on their own are not influenced. However, collectives are. Groups of people are very sensitive to alarm, for example, um, whereas individuals are not. So there's potentially collective filtering of emotion um, within these groups too. That's a very quick, quick summary of what, what, what one to work. Yeah, I'm just curious if you've looked at systems where there may be conflict between the optimal strategies and time. So that, you know, if you've got some sort of optimal strategy later in time, that's what we'll also like in the future, so there has to be some uncertainty around that strategy. It's a finality, but yes. you can drive a Certainly, some of the I mean, some of the optimal strategies change as the system, as part of the system adopts certain strategies that's optimal. Um, that then depends what the optimal strategy is. So you can have this kind of recursive feedback over a short time scale. So a classic example would be the producer stranger game, where you know birds will either produce information, go out and look for food themselves, or strange information from others, and change strategies in order of seconds. You know, so a really high temporal dynamic. But that of course is not evolutionary. That's a developmental. It's a great question. I have to think more about that, but I would not be surprised if there were lots of examples where time scales are really important. I mean, I think I, I think back to bacteria actually in, in, in this case, where you know things like you know antibiotics, you might want to have a fast response to the environment and more time scale. Yeah, I think that's probably enough time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you notice any effort by the minority? group with really strong opinion to convert or give information to the uninformed opinion to change their view? Well, I mean, they are doing that, right, through these local rules. They are, they, you know, by having a stronger opinion, you have a much stronger influence on uninformed individuals. If you just have, if you just have a, a, a subset of informed and uninformed, increasing the strength of the informed subsets, their, their omega, increasing the strength of their opinion, exerts an increasingly strong effect on the uninformed individual. But if the number is too large, then the dynamic split that goes to majority. Yeah, but there's, there's lots of, um, it's, it's quite subtle here, because the important point here is that increasing your omega does make you more influential, okay? Despite that, the system level dynamics converge to a different factor. So despite that, the fact that being opinionated actually exerts a stronger influence on those around you, the collective level dynamics are so robust that it overrides that effect. And so in the final figure in the supplement, and this is like typical papers, like two and a half pages in the actual journal, and 35 pages in the supplement. But the final figure in the supplement shows this, 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 this scenario. And we don't fully understand what's going on um, yet, because the swarm model is quite difficult to understand. That's why we've moved towards these abstracted versions. Yeah. <laughs> 
So we, you, you've been using a Bayesian model fitting approach, um, whereby you can you can then um, sort of directly compare different hypotheses regarding the instrument, the interest topology. In that particular experiment, what we did was we would have a certain portion of individuals within the group that had information, and the laser would, would shine somewhere in the arena, and these individuals would respond to it, and the uninformed would never respond to it. And so we get these waves of propagating behaviors crossing the group. And so using these discrete transitions between not responding and responding that we saw, we could then ask, how, uh, how is it, you know, the, bit, the change of behavior of those around you, how does that impact you? And is it, you know, are you interacting? So firstly, it turns out to be the fraction that are in one state versus the other state. Um, and for all of the models, that comes out as the, the, the Bayesian model suggests that's the, the, the most likely by quite a long way. And then secondly, the, the result that shows you there, which is that if we, if, if we say that you are interacting say, within any fixed community, so of course we look at any fixed gradient or any number of interacting neighbors, um, we, we find that in actual fact the visual network performs much, much better. And the reason is, this is something actually really interesting, is that if you look at the metric and the topological network, they're in the same class of network topology in, in, in across all parameters. However, the visual network, the real visual network, has a much, much lower transitivity across the full range of potential parameters, including the best fit. So the visual network is actually a different class of network. And that's probably why we're picking it from a distance. And the reason this to be important is if you have very low transitivity, this means, you know, if I'm connected to you, and you're, you're, you're connected, and then we're also connected, that would have a very um, high degree of transitivity, right? We're all connected to each other. And that might seem a good thing, because for message passing, you know, if I want to communicate with you, I don't have to go through Mark. I can just go directly to you. So the mean path length is very, very low. But there's also correlation of information. And so, and what, so what you would naively expect is these visual networks have a much, much lower transitivity, so we cut these connections then you'd expect the number of hops it takes for information to get across the group would increase. But counterintuitively, if you analyze the mean path length, it's low. So these networks have a lower transitivity, much lower transitivity, which means correlation to information is not a problem. New information can flood into the group. And also, the number of hops it takes for information to get across the group is smaller. So it's, it's really quite counterintuitive. So we think that these, these, these visually mediated networks are very important um, for the information process. So initially, you know, when we were looking to, to the relating to the work I just described this trade, initially we were thinking that okay, visual networks just allow you to have some local interactions, but every now and again you get like a long range peak through the group. So it's a bit like a small world network that you have these long range connections. That's not what's happening. Um, it's much more subtle than that, and it relates to spatial access. So if we compare the best fit topological models and metric models and visual network models to ask which neighbors are under or overrepresented in these in these other models that don't work. We find that the visual network is, um, is representing uh, fewer neighbors to the side and more directly to the front and also to the behind. So you've got more sort of elongated, um, which kind of makes intuitive sense. Um, but it, you know, that, that, that turns out to be very important for these types of properties and information transfer. So, uh, super question. So do you find any kind of correlation you can make as you look at groups of individuals with increasing intelligence and complexity within the individual? So even, yeah. even not making the leap to humans, but for example, in fish, we compare your golden shiners to a fish like a uh, uh, Tanganyika cichlid, yeah. you know, known to be very super intelligent, smart, yeah. right, super smart. Yeah. Do you see any kind of general, you know, general differences between them? And number two, have you looked at, I'm just curious if you've consulted with these, you know, I've looked at some of the sponsors on there, like ONR and Marco, et cetera, and you mentioned, for example, the mm -hmm. individuals doing something wrong. Uh, two questions after that, or have you ever looked at, um, I mean, there is commercial software, like
return to the previous question, I think this is a fascinating uh, thing uh, and, um, in ants, the devil dog probably knows much more about this than me. You know, it, there seems to be potentially some sort of trade-off. You know, look at army ants where the, you know, everything's really strongly collective. You know, they've even lost their vision because it's expensive to run a visual system, right? So everything is coordinated to be the collective. They're relatively simple automaton-like creatures compared to, say, um, 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 Ponerai ants, you know, that, that tend to sort of forage more or less individualistically and have to do all of the different jobs. You know, they have much bigger brains, bigger eyes, uh, greater navigation capacity. Um, and there's one paper by Bert Holdobler on this, right? I find it not all that convincing, but in the, but that would be one system that you could probably look at. Maybe people have done that to look at this trade off between individual complexity and collective complexity. But I've always wondered with fish, like, what, you know, we could have the data to look at least at proxies like brain volume or certain regions of brain size to look to see the trade off between sociality and also the loss of sociality. Um, and um, I, I don't think anyone has done that. I mean, there's a big disparity between um, the types of collectives I look at and other systems. So, for example, if you think about the social intelligence hypothesis in primates, you know, the argument that being in groups, you need to have a big brain to deal with your social interactions, that's not entirely true because you know, otherwise, uh, as has been said, you know, will be, would be wizards. Um, so, the types of groups that I look at, you know, they really are solving these problems through the collective. When you deal with really higher order things, like having to remember, like particular things, having to remember who you've interacted with. Um, and so on, then it feels it's much more complex. Well, one, one thing I, I want to mention, I moved to fish because I wanted to move towards from ants to a more, what I would consider more cognitively, potential cognitively advanced organism. And in some ways, <laughs> these fish are so dumb. You know, they really, they, they've really evolved to do everything collectively. So what I'm now looking for is, is essentially sort of things like electric fish, where they group together, but they also have individual recognition. So I don't want to work on climate, it's too difficult. So I want to work on COVID, and also potentially on electric fish, where there's individual recognition, where there's um, there's more complexity in terms of social structure. Uh, so I, I would like to move towards that to get somewhere else. So if there's no more questions, thank you very much for coming.